we've kind of been working. We started with the periodic table a while back, right? And then we said, OK, now that we know all the stuff about the periodic table, there's these special bonds, right, where they get connected. Okay? And then we finally are getting kind of into the kind of crux of chemistry, which is the reaction, a chemical reaction. And that's what you're going to be exploring over the next few days, are chemical reactions. Okay. For this lab, I was looking at uh, addressing the Next Gen Science Standard uh, PS1-4, which is, has to deal with chemical reactions. Um, I not only wanted to give them access to the standard, but I also wanted them to be exposed to other lab techniques, such as an investigative lab, as well as data analysis, and, and really collaborating with their peers. This chemical reaction, we're going to watch, and we're going to kind of see what evidence is there that a chemical reaction has occurred. Okay. So who has heard of hydrogen peroxide? Oh, yeah. What do we use hydrogen peroxide for? Cuts. Cuts, right? Clean out the cuts. Cleans out the cut. Uh, basically kills all of them. The whole beginning of this unit was, was focused on chemical reactions. So I, I chose the, you know, probably most dramatic chemical reaction I could think about, which was the elephant toothpaste, which was 30% uh, hydrogen peroxide with potassium iodide. And it provides this violent reaction that gets, you know, this, this big explosion, all kinds of bubbles everywhere, and the kids aren't expecting it. And it's like, whoa. Um, which gets them really excited, hopefully hooks them into like, what are we going to learn? Data analysis, <laughs> great. <laughs> but um, it, it, it was a nice starting point to be like, okay, this was a chemical reaction. Now, how do we know a chemical reaction occurred? Oh, there were bubbles. Oh, there was a color change. Oh, it emitted heat. And now all of a sudden, before we've even done anything in the lesson, they are already learning things, you know, associated with a chemical reaction. All right, what, what evidence was there that a chemical reaction occurred? Two of, them, two of them mixed and they made another thing. Okay, the, the creation of the foam, what else? The explosion. The explosion, what else? Um, and gas oh, gas, what was that, what, what would that tell me about? What was happening because I saw this gas coming off? It's getting hotter, so it's releasing energy. Okay, so that's something else for sure. If you look, I mean, we see the purple food coloring, but do you see any other colors? Yellow. Oh, you see that yellow, probably something to do with the iodine. So that kind of tells me there's a reaction, there's a color change, right? So I saw heat being released, I saw, um, I saw bubbles being made, I saw a change in color, I saw energy being released. So I saw all these things, um, and I think it's pretty obvious that what I ended with is not what I started with. So today is all about the background. And instead of me giving you all that information, you are going to come up with that information on your own. So what I would like you to do is go in your notebooks to page 49. Well, I didn't provide an actual lecture just because I, I, I wanted them to take a little bit more ownership in it. Um, you know, if I was, I could stand up there for 45 minutes and drone on and they would have written the notes down studiously like students are supposed to do. But my hope was by them actually researching it, they would um, kind of take a little bit more ownership in it and also learn some things that they didn't know otherwise. You know, they were, they were forced to find it on their own. Okay, so a physical change just changes how it looks basically. It doesn't actually change the chemical. And a chemical change thing. changes it. Yeah. I mean, no, no matter what, if it's boiling water or it turns into another cold form of water, or, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, there's still water, so. But with it, that one. But a chemical change, change would change the whole thing. The whole thing. It would be water. It would change it to other chemical. You will be in a group of four. This group of four will be executing four different experiments. Everyone has a role, and if you don't do your role, your group won't finish in time because you're going to have about 40 minutes to complete four experiments. Well, in the, in the lab on the second day, um, each group was charged with performing four experiments. Um, they were all experiments that the students were pretty familiar with. Um, I found that the California students were not too familiar with the hand warmer <laughs> because they're from Southern California. But other than that, um, the four reactions that they had to do were concrete mixed with water, rock salt mixed with ice, um, the ingredients of cold packs that you break and, and the chemicals mix to, to drop the temperature, as well as the chemicals for hand warmers. They brought the, the chemicals back to their station. They mixed them. 
They put a temperature probe inside of the beakers and then from there monitored the temperature change over time. And then as they were um, gathering that data, rather than just writing it in their notebook, I had given them a Google form that they inputted um, the data online so that then they could send it to me and I could collect all the data for all the classes throughout the day. We're going to be actually taking all of the data, not just your data, but taking all of the data from um, most of the groups throughout the day. I basically took 15 groups randomly throughout the day. And I put them all in one file for you to get. And you're going to take that file and you're going to graph that data. And then after you graph that data, we're going to have a discussion about what does it look like? What, do we, what can we learn about the chemical reactions? You could just say the overall outliers were below 10, close to the <laughs> negative. Like, this one was like, what, a 1, 2, and 3 degrees when everybody was like at 20-something? I don't get these because if it's a heat warmer, you would expect the heat to be high, not in almost the zeros. So yeah. that doesn't make sense. At all. And then after they kind of wrestled with the data and tried to draw some conclusions and figure out what was happening, I went through each experiment. I projected the data on the, or I projected the graph on the screen. And once the graph was on the screen, we kind of talked about, oh, what are we seeing here? Does the data tell us it's endothermic or does the data tell us it's exothermic? Hey, what's that line down there? Hey, why is this data point way up here? Hey, why is this data really clumped from this experiment but really spread out from this experiment? Which really was a great starting point for, you know, dozens of different um, realities in science. Is there any data that doesn't really make sense? The bottom two. Oh, those two points at the bottom. Okay. What could have caused those? A mistake. A mistake. Maybe they plugged it in wrong. Okay. Okay, maybe they, it was the wrong, the wrong file because some group said that happened. Now, looking at those data points, we kind of have two like categories. Outliers or errors. Outliers are like, oh, that's kind of weird. Errors is like something had to be wrong. Based off of those, what do we think those are? They're, they're probably errors. I mean, if you've got like 250 data points clumped together in two way separate, those are probably errors, okay? So the as, as I find myself implementing the next gen science standards um, more and more, um, I, I'm finding my classroom become a much greater emphasis on what the students are able to do. It's not, uh, the, the science concepts are important. The science concepts are a big part of it. But those skills, which I think were so overlooked for so many years, are now coming to the forefront. And it's really exciting, all the different things that you can do with those skills.